Hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm truly delighted to be moderating this panel on semiconductors. Um, and the theme of the panel could not come at a more opportune time. Uh, the US-China tech and trade war is moving to new heights. Uh, a new round of US technology export controls have been imposed that will affect the flow of high-end semiconductors and semiconductor manufacturing equipment to Beijing. Uh, in fact, the Bureau of Industry and Security of the US Department of Commerce has a series of policy changes that involve additional export controls on certain advanced computer, um, uh, computing semiconductor chips, et cetera. The Bureau has also adopted additional set of controls on certain semiconductor manufacturing items on transaction and on transactions for certain IC and uh, IC end use. All of these policy changes come in the backdrop of the Biden administration's earlier Chip Act and Chips and Science Act that is also going to be looking at how do we develop the or ensure the US competence or the dominance in this particular region in, the, in this area. The accelerating competition that furthers innovation in a number of semiconductor uh, in a number of areas, critical technologies such as the A5G, automation, autonomous electric vehicles, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth, these are of critical importance from a strategic perspective. Given the strategic importance, the new export, US export controls are significant because, in a sense, they prohibit the transfer or sale of semiconductors made with US technology without an export license, and the process for, the US, for China to acquire these technologies have been made a lot more stringent. The US has also put limitations on US citizens and entities engaging with Chinese chip makers without, again, procuring uh, specific approval, which presumably will become a lot more problematic in the coming days. These new restrictions are fairly extensive and could impose severe economic and technological pains on Beijing, at least in the short term. For China, semiconductors is quite significant with impact on Chinese research in areas like artificial intelligence, high performance computing, and supercomputers. The new rules also restrict exports of chip making tools and technology to China that Chinese companies could use in order to manufacture their own equipment. Of course, China makes a number of different uh, types of chips, but for, but for cutting edge computer chips that go into smartphones, supercomputers, or AI systems, Beijing has had to rely on a number of other countries in the, uh, and industries in these countries, whether in the US or other US partner countries, such as Japan or the Netherlands. This, of course, allows the US and its partner countries to cut off the supply of chips to Chinese state or private sectors that threaten international security and so on and so forth. But it's not the US alone that is taking up these kind of restrictive measures. In fact, uh, the U EU had come out with its own Chips Act that will, again, enforce various restrictions on the flow of some of these technologies to China. In fact, since 2019, there have been a number of export control measures by the US as well as the US partner countries that have made access to these critical technologies a lot more difficult for China and Russia. This is significant because globally, industries from the United States, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and the Netherlands have dominated the semiconductor industry. But others like India are also joining the global race to shape global semiconductor supply chains. To take us through all of these issues, we have five eminent speakers. So let me start off with some of the broad questions uh, that, uh, that can trigger some of the trends that we see in the semiconductor industry. So to get us started, maybe I'll start off with Wong Yi Cho, given that he comes from a more of an IR and political background. What are the major pol geopolitical trends that are driving the national semiconductor strategies? Um, and also looking at some of the contemporary developments and debates emanating from tensions over the Taiwan Strait. Uh, or even the uh, Russian invasion of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. How do these developments uh, impact upon the semiconductor strategies, uh, including for Korea? You can talk about the national strategy, how we are looking at it. Uh, thank you, uh, Raji. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, my background is uh, international relations. Uh, so I'd like to share my political perspective from a South Korean uh, standpoint. Uh, how South Korean chip makers Samsung and SK Hynix are reacting to the recent uh, developments. You know that uh, in Korea, uh, we have uh, a few internationally competitive industrial sectors, and uh, one of which is a semiconductor. So Samsung and SK Hynix account for 
60% of global memory chip uh, making. And 60% uh, of the memory chips these two global players make goes to Chinese market. So basically, uh, Samsung and Hynix are making memory chips based on US originated technology. And uh, uh, the uh, chip making equipments uh, imported abroad, ASMR uh, in, in Netherlands and other Japanese and source material as well. So they are uh, making chips based on foreign uh, materials, equipments, and technologies and export them mostly to China. So now you have US, new US export control measures here. And uh, Samsung and SK Hynix and South Korean government lobbied quite diligently to Americans and got one year waiver. So uh, in the, in the <clears throat> coming uh, one year, they are able to still uh, import the equipment from abroad in their production facility in China in uh, Xi'an, uh, Suzhou, uh, and I don't remember this. Anyhow, so they are maintaining uh, their uh, production, chip making production facility in China. But the problem is what would happen after the waiver, one year waiver period is over? Uh, I mean, it is obvious that US wants Samsung and SK completely pull out of China. But for now, I think, I mean, we have a domestic debates going on, and we have some interviews and comments made from the corporate leaders from these uh, companies, and I don't think they have the definite answer right now. Uh, so they, have, they are kind of agonizing what to do uh, about this. So because uh, the, the Samsung and SK located just in between, in global semiconductor supply chain between uh, U.S. and China, so they are kind of a, a, a look, they are standing at the forefront of tech war going on between U.S. and China. Uh, so I think uh, they are thinking about uh, Plan B. For now, they are trying to maintain their uh, facilities in China. But I mean, you have only one year left. So I don't think they are uh, ready and able to invest more uh, in to upgrade their facilities in, in China. So I think the, uh, the, um, the, the future prospect of their uh, kind of a relationship with China and their uh, maintenance of their production facility in China is very unclear. Uh, and uh, I, my personally, uh, I personally think that eventually they will try to find a plan, contingent plan, a plan B, try to get out of China. Then the question is, where do they want to go? Do they want to relocate uh, the, the, uh, back to South Korea, or do they try to find uh, some, some uh, alternative in Southeast Asia, or India for that matter? Uh, and also, uh, yeah, so this is kind of uh, the kind of constraints and uh, pressure they, they face. But there is also an uh, upside of the story. I mean, uh, I mean in, in, in the, the, the recent uh, Chinese Communist Party's, uh, Party Congress, Xi Jinping made two specific points regarding the uh, tech war. He would not back down American pressure. So he tried to go on with his own uh, kind of plan to, uh, to, to make uh, China in the leader in, in, in the, uh, uh, the um, high tech industry, including semiconductor. So I think the, the level of uh, contention and uh, competition will be increased down the road. And another uh, point he made was that uh, he would not exclude the possibility of use of uh, military force in, in, in uh, uniting with uh, Taiwan, which uh, puts lots of geopolitical risks on TSMC, which is the competitor to Samsung and SK Hynix. So I think uh, for now, uh, TSMC is the most favorable partner to US uh, kind of chip four kind of alliance, right? So I think, uh, in that regard, I think Samsung and SK is, is, a, is a better position. Uh, they, have, they don't have the kind of geopolitical risk and uncertainty that the TSMC is facing right now. So, so in that regard, I think um, 
uh, India is also in a very good position. I mean, uh, I think uh, all of these things and about the, 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 the strategic trust, it's about strategic trust. The economic security is about strategic trust. If uh, Americans have a higher level of uh, trust in China, you don't have this kind of export control measures, right? So in their regard, I think India has very huge potential to come in as a major player down the road. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I take that question to Viraj if you can talk about the uh, influence of some of the major geopolitical trends that we see in how that is shaping this national semiconductor strategy, um, including for India, but also if you want to look at some of the broader trends that we're seeing. Sure. Um, thanks. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of excitement, obviously, about the semiconductor uh, policy and uh, uh, you know what's going on. But it's not our first shot at it. Uh, I think about eight years ago, uh, uh, the the government. I think it was started by the previous government and continued by this government. But they came pretty close to. Uh, I mean, they had a policy and they came pretty close to. There were people interested and they came pretty close to, uh, you know, approving. A f couple of fab projects, semiconductor fab projects, but it didn't take off for various reasons. So I think the kind of investment that's needed in this uh, uh, industry, um, you need obviously, wherever it's come up, it's come up with a huge amount of government support. Uh, and of course, you need technological partners. So you need, a, I think you need a particular climate for it to take off, which was probably not there uh, fully, you know, seven or eight years ago, even though the government may have had intent. Uh, you know, so I think what what we have now is the perfect confluence, uh, at least for a country like India, you know, where you know post COVID, obviously uh, the world is looking for China plus one, or you know, an alternate now perhaps not even China plus one, an alternate to uh, China. There's a greater willingness, uh, you know, to do industrial policy. I think again, that environment has changed. You know, it, it it's easier now to make the argument. Though there are uh, pro very prominent opponents to it who say that you know the same amount of money could be invested in a whole lot of other things, uh, so I think there's a large sum of money. But now I think it's uh, the, the the environment is more conducive for the government to say we're going to put 76,000 crore rupees or 10 billion dollars into subsidizing uh, you know this in, in industry. So I think you know the, the geopolitical uh, mood, people are more willing to share technology uh, partnerships from the countries which actually make it. So I think the, the the environment, this is the perfect moment. If not now, probably never. And that's probably why it didn't happen earlier, because you didn't have everything you know, falling into place. The quantum of subsidy, I think the, eight years ago, they were giving 25%. Now it's 50% of uh, you know, CapEx. So I think the states have come forward this time around uh, uh, much with much more uh, force than they did last time around. So I think uh, you have a confluence of the government's intent here, the, the international uh, you know, geopolitical situation, uh, which makes uh, you know this uh, a viable uh, possibility to take off. Obviously, there are still you know a number of uh, challenges because we've not done this before. But then, very few countries have. I mean, if you actually look at the bleeding edge technologies, 92% uh, is which is for 10 nm and below. It's 92% is Taiwan and Korea. Uh, you know, if you look at even overall, about 78 or 80 percent is in Asia. Uh, you know, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, China, uh, Europe and the US and Israel together probably have about 22%, right? And nobody else has anything. So it's a fairly concentrated uh, market. And I think this is the point at which the diversification happens. So that's so, so one point is that India is getting into it and there's a policy and we may get three or four semiconductor fabs. But the more interesting uh, thing looking ahead with all the developments that you spoke about in your introduction in terms of the way the US is acting and the US allies will act, is that it opens up even more uh, opportunities uh, for India uh, uh, in, in the sense of you know, even attracting the bleeding edge kind of uh, technologies here. Because right now, I think what we're talking about in India is more 28, 45, 65, not so much you know, 10 and under or the cutting edge, uh, which, which may take some time. It may not happen immediately. But once we have a semiconductor fab ecosystem here, and given the way geopolitics is going, I don't suspect this is going to reverse anytime soon. You know, Xi Jinping, now president for life, the US moving in a particular direction, in a bipartisan way. Uh, so I think this gives us a huge opportunity five, 10 years down the road uh, to actually become one of those uh, you know, manufacturing hubs for semiconductors beyond East Asia and Europe and the US. So 
if we speak about the geopolitical trends here to come to your first question and very broadly, very fundamentally what we see is that there's a general recognition of the criticality that semiconductors as a technology poses. So this is something that has become uh, all pervasive. It, we see that it's ubiquitous, you know. Um, we see that for all these countries, they have an eye to the future. They believe in uh, 5G, in, in IoT, in the emerging technologies taking a lead for their economies. And the semiconductor is the device that would empower all of it, something like, let's say, the food grain of the digital economy, or the lifeblood of it. And, uh, and it's something that's also become part of our general conversations today. So this is something, this is something that we haven't seen before. Uh, for example, during COVID times, right, when the entire economy was shut down, we all, it was the semiconductor that was powering our um, audio and video processing units that kept us working from our laptops. Um, it, and you know, just yesterday, uh, my boss told me that, you know, I don't know anything about semiconductors, but I know it's important because I haven't received my car keys. And so it's, it's just something that, you know, everybody's talking about today. And that's uh, the public, in fact, has made a huge impact on how we look at it, how the government looks at it. And that's sort of what's made them very conscious about, as Bhirad spoke about, the concentration of capacities. As he said, you know, that, the, that East Asia and China have 75% of the manufacturing capacities. Um, if, we, if we look at advanced uh, semiconductor technology that's focused on Taiwan, that's focused on South Korea. So uh, this consciousness, you know, that we might be losing our strategic autonomy, we might not be able to power some of our ambitions going ahead, is the thinking that's behind uh, the government sort of coming out with these incentives. To, uh, did they understand the business model of semiconductor companies? That, you know, it's very capital intensive. There's a high barrier of entry. And, this, and these incentives are meant to sweeten the pot, you know, so that um, they're able to diversify and not be dependent on certain geographies. Speaking specifically uh, about the UK, I think that uh, there's a lot of um, synergy when it comes to design, because we know that India has about 20% of the uh, design engineers globally, and the UK has uh, very specifically, uh, let's say, ARM as well as Imagine Technologies, which are very high-end design companies. And so there's a lot of synergy to be found there. There's a lot of synergy in partnerships that we can find to sort of um, diversify our ecosystem a lot more and for the benefit of all. Uh, Vinod Dam, um, I think the question I also want to ask in the context of the changing geopolitical developments, um, what should governments of emerging economies like India should, uh, should be doing? Um, because there have been talk about the strongest opportunities are possibly in building uh, assembly testing, marketing, uh, simply ATMPs. Or should India be also pairing that with the longer term strategies in terms of uh, investment? Because these are, these are again, uh, need large amounts of uh, resources to go into this. So how do you look at uh, India's strategy? Is it, should it be paired with the longer term strategy? And what is the feasibility or how practical is it um, from national strategy perspective in a sense? Thank you, Rajiv. <clears throat> before I speak, uh, in fact, I wonder why I'm sitting here. But before I speak, I want to put a caveat. Um, whatever I say here is purely my personal views um, based on my entire life, from the day I started working till now in semiconductors, uh, 47 years in USA. Uh, bulk of the years at Intel working for Andy Grove and Gordon Knowles. I'm uh, known as father of Pentium for having done the Pentium chip. Before that, 486, and before that, 386. Uh, and I have a very unique perspective on all of this because of my uh, both being there in Silicon Valley all my life and uh, watching what went on geopolitically, both in India, where I've been very keen on, like uh, Mr. Nair said, <laughs> for three decades coming and talking to ministers, trying to convince them one way or the other. Uh, uh, but there is a definite change now, I feel, a very significant change uh, in terms of the attitude and what India wants to do. And by the way, in full disclosure, I'm also uh, an advisor to the government of India, one of the many on this India Semiconductor Mission, which is involved in setting up the fab. And my involvement is more on the fabrication side, uh, process technology side, um, which is most crucial right now. So with that as a uh, uh, background, um, India clearly uh, has missed the boat on semiconductors. 
India is trying to get into semiconductor fabrication uh, 50 years too late. Uh, my boss had a law called Moore's Law. It's about 50 years old. And it's coming to an end. And we are joining the race when the Moore's Law is coming to an end. Quite a uh, irony of the whole thing. So we missed out on 50 years of learning curve, which comes cumulatively by being in the field and doing things repeatedly, going from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, but the good news is uh, semiconductors, unlike the times that I was doing initially at Intel, are no longer a uh, uh, art. They are a science. So they are highly automated. You can set up fabs anywhere in the world as long as you get your utilities and all the other things met, you can run it anywhere the way you run it uh, in USA. So that's, that extent, uh, it's not too late. Uh, someone talked about trusted partner. Clearly, we are the trusted partner. But I will, uh, just a personal opinion, uh, for US, nobody's a trusted partner. You're a trusted partner till you're a trusted partner. Uh, it's the uh, uh, fair weather friends. When you need them, you need to be on the side. If you're not, then you're not on the side. Uh, I was one of the few people, or many people perhaps, who was wondering all this last decade as to what was going on in US, giving away so much of technology to China, especially when they were already beginning to uh, understand that the very dream that Nixon had and Kissinger had of going to China in 1971 and thinking that they would transform this communist society by upgrading them with the economic lot to make them more liberal, more democratic, more free thinking was not materializing. If anything, Xi Jinping was trying to close in. If uh, any of you had read about him, there was an article about him, 26 pages long when he became the prime minister, what, eight, 10 years ago? In the Atlantic magazine uh, in USA. Uh, every word of it is coming out true. Uh, his father was a good uh, associate of uh, Mao Zedong, and Xi Jinping was one of the young fellows watching the whole thing happen when Mao was playing his game. So some of us not surprised at all as to what's going on. and. Uh, we are happy that Biden and others are also not surprised and are beginning to make uh, decisive moves only in the last two weeks. I know it creates a lot of issue with Korea and South Korea, and uh, I'm pretty sure it makes my personal wealth has gone down by 30% because all my semiconductor stocks are down. NVIDIA is not allowed to sell advanced AI chips to them. The equipment companies cannot sell equipment to them. So, but those are the ways you can stop. The, this whole process and freeze it. So actually, US has frozen access to Chinese companies for equipment, which is a fundamental thing. You need to build chips. And fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for US, all the equipment, 80% of it is built in US. Applied materials, land research, uh, two of the top companies. And then there's one company in Europe, ASML, and US has huge influence to make sure they take them into uh, their own fold and prevent the most advanced lithography equipment technology to, to have access into China. I, I do, do agree it's creating a lot of chaos, and it's not clear how it's all going to work out vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the, the world and uh, where the chips are going to fall. I don't think it's very clear at this stage. Um, I think India, the biggest difference I feel at this time of my personal involvement commitment to the Indian government uh, is that uh, Prime Minister Modi ji himself has understood, uh, and there's a word in Indian language called Atma Nirvar, which fundamentally means self-reliance, and that he wants to be self-reliant about technologies and not really have a lot of money be spent on importing them. Uh, and I think it started from that point of view, saying if we want to be uh, self-reliant about this, we need to start getting into semiconductor fab. 
However, we must realize in today's day and age, there is nothing like uh, being self-reliant in semiconductors. The chains that literally thousands of suppliers that feed into building a fab, thousands, not hundreds, not tens, not dozens, thousands of them. So how this is all going to really shake up yet remains to be seen. Uh, so with that, as a thesis from India and the policies that they have laid out, which are highly incentivized, and both the state government and federal government, from what I can tell you, I think about 70 to 80 percent of the cost of building a fab is being picked up by government of India. Um, but still, due to lack of any ecosystem we have here, and the fact that uh, there's a lot of nationalistic semiconductor things going on in U.S. and other places, and clearly the inflation in U.S. and all the markets dropping, the CEOs of these companies don't have bandwidth to think about India right now. So a lot of advice that I'm giving to the government of India is to uh, move in a way that we can still accomplish our goals, but do it keeping in mind the environment that has uh, presented itself to us over the last six to eight months in particular. I'm not sure I answered your question. No, I think we are getting there. because, But I think um, given that you seem to be especially talking about Ahmedabad and or self-sufficient, uh, self-reliance, uh, some form of self-reliance is something that we have been hearing for like a mantra for several decades now, whether it is in, in, on the defense sector. But in any case, I think given the kind of overall incentive structures that the government has created, you seem to be hopeful. And we'll come back to that in any way. Uh, so let me go to Rahul and look at some of these current developments and what are the kind of opportunities that we see emerging for countries like India or what are the kind of changes that you would see with the new digitalization um, trends? I think Deeraj and, and um, Vinod both hit that in terms of what, how the landscape is transforming. And, and again, we still have to wait for the reaction from China, which is going to play out in, in the coming days in terms of what they do. But going back to the geopolitical situation, it's, it's not just the curbs on China. There's also the conflict in Europe. And as Vinod said, the supply chains crisscross across the world. And for example, a big portion of the neon production, which is required for process manufacturing, is done in Eastern Europe. And that is getting a little bit choked. And there's the ramifications we will see. So and yes, trust is a very seasonal word. Um, and hopefully, we remain on the right side of trust. From um, to, to go back to your previous question that you asked a little bit, should emerging comp, uh, countries like us invest in an ATMP kind of model or go to a more aggressive model? Um, I do think we need to go to a crawl, walk, run kind of phase, and I think Dira alluded to it a little bit. You know, we don't necessarily need to go to the cutting edge right away. We're starting off in a, a little bit older technology where a lot of volume still exists. And it makes sense to a build credibility in that space, get the ecosystem and all the infrastructure and the regulation that's required. And with time, I think if the trends continue, it will naturally pan out for us getting into some of the cutting, cutting edge technologies. At the same time, um, I personally do believe that a lot of innovation is going to come in packaging and how we put things together. What the core technology has given us, and you know, uh, Mr. Dam said Moore's Law is coming to an end. Um, Moore's Law, as it was defined, is coming to an end. The integration of transistors per square millimeter, if you take that as a metric, that's not necessarily coming to an end. And you can, we are already at over 100 million transistors per square millimeter. Right? And with heterogeneous integration and packaging innovation, that is a space where a lot of innovation has to happen. We are not, we've not missed the bus on that. It's an opportunity, a green field that we can, we can go into. And with some of the advanced packaging technologies, we can definitely capitalize on that and build on it with the talent that we have. The other part I do want to add is having some kind of fabs here um, will also hopefully enable a lot of hardware startups. Today, I think there's a little bit of dearth in that area, and it's the capacity problem as well. Where do we do proof of concepts? And you know, I'll refer to Korea, for example, and 
a lot of startups do happen there because of the presence of Samsung and Hynix and the, the ability to prototype small chips, get the initial bugs worked out and then transform that into a product. Uh, hopefully that will also help us if we go down this path. So I do think the political situation is ripe for us. We've missed the bus on um, manufacturing in terms of semiconductor technology, but not in terms of packaging. So I think that's something we should really emphasize on. So ATM piece is a good way. And the talent does exist here. Uh, it's also a, um, a little packaging is less cost intensive, but requires skill and labor, which we can train. And you know that's where the ITIs and the other partners in this in the space come together to help the government to take this forward. So you said there is a certain amount of talent, but I've also read some of your uh, interviews and pieces where you talk about there are certain pockets where these talents exist. So how do you make them uh, more worthwhile in terms of actually making some of these capabilities um, and converting the product? Yeah, so I, I, again. Or, or the more even a bigger question maybe is in terms of what are the kind of policy environment that the changes that you need to see or how do you incentivize uh, more talent creation in that sense? There is a certain talent in certain pockets, but how do you make them uh, convert into a more, more useful product in a sense at the end of the day? Yeah, so I think part of it is the, the dearth of talent is because of the uncertainty of where we're actually going to go. I think once people do get an idea of this is the direction we're going to take, other players, including corporations like IBM, will come forward to do some of the knowledge transfer, know-how, et cetera, to institutions, to bodies, to voluntary training, uh, training facilities, et cetera. I think corporations like us and um, technologists like us have a responsibility to do give back, technical give back, and through curriculum modification, through consortiums with like-minded companies. You know, there's a a semiconductor research program, which under the semiconductor research corporation, there's an India research program which funds research in hardware design and manufacturing in Indian institutions. This it's been running for the last five years, but right? I think those kind of programs have to spread out to a much wider class of institutions and geographies within India or, or regions within India to get the to tap the talent that actually exists. So I think it's a question of once we know where we're going. Sure. I think there are about five ways we are approaching uh, from the India Semiconductor Mission point of view as to how to proceed with setting up a semiconductor ecosystem in India. First and foremost, and it's not necessarily going to happen in the order that I'm describing, is to bring IDMs, integrated device manufacturers, who will come in turnkey, set up a cluster of fabs. Uh, for their expansion activity going into future. As some of you may know, uh, it took us 50 years to get to about $500 billion in revenues in semiconductor. It's going to take us 10 years only to double that number to a trillion dollars. So next 10 years, we are projected to double the amount of semiconductor chips we could be producing worldwide. So there's a huge need for semiconductor chips. And therefore, a lot of expansion is going to take place. So we are attracting, or we are working with some very key companies one-on-one uh, -on -one to try to bring them to India to expand. Because when they do that, they will create an ecosystem of know-how, of semiconductors. They'll bring their expats. They will bring, teach us a lot of things. The second is we are trying to do some joint partnerships, where there's an Indian company uh, putting in a lot of capital along with the government. And the outside companies bringing in technology, know-how to set up a fab. And these fab need not be, like somebody said, five micron or below. Mm -hmm. In fact, 28 nanometers is a sweet spot for most of the applications. Even if they are 45, uh, that's fine with us. Because for the kind of applications we need in India right now, uh, those may suffice. So that's the second aspect of it. Clearly attached to that is a back end. I did not address the ATMP. We absolutely take that for granted. That's the easiest thing we can do. Uh, we don't think, uh, and, and I'm very hopeful in near future you'll hear some good news about those kinds of things. It's the fab that is much harder to bring about. The third element is really the skills that uh, Rahul talked about. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, I don't know how many of you know how India became an IT destination 
uh, watching sitting uh, in Silicon Valley, I clearly saw in 95 to 2000, US companies for the first time getting exposed to the Indian engineers who they thought were snake charmers and will just come in and fix a Y2K code and were given a very specific ta task of fixing the code in a 50-year-old software algorithms that they had written. But our engineers came in, and not only they fixed the code, they rewrote the code, they upgraded the code, they wrote new formulas, and it was shocking. And fortunately for India, there was a dot bomb that took place in 2000, right after that. And all the US companies were left with re reducing cost. And therefore, they quickly came to India, having known and been exposed to our engineers and their capabilities, said, please, do this software for us. And that's really when the IT industry in, in India began to take off in a serious way. Until then it existed, but it wasn't really as big as it was. Unfortunately, we do not have a similar skill set of semiconductor engineers in India. There are, by the way, a large number of, I, I don't know what the number is, 25,000 or so, chip designers. And everyone from, uh, NVIDIA to AMD to Intel. Intel has, in fact, the largest presence, including in US and Israel now in India, for chip design. But I'm talking about really the fabrication side of things. We do not have, right now, today, that type of skill set. But there's a huge program. So I was in IIT Delhi uh, as part of my this trip. Um, and the seven IITs and Indian Institute of Sciences have been collected together, and there's a huge program being started to create skills with masters and PhD programs in semiconductors. And we are gonna use, I was also in Chandigarh, there's a fab called SCL, which is an old fab running at 180 nanometer. And I visited them and toured them, and my recommendations to the minister was to use, start using it for at least skill training, having our engineers, our students go in there, hands-on build the chips, so they know what exactly this whole thing is about. You know, building chips is like, you know, being a doctor. You don't become a doctor until you go in and do some, uh, it's not computer you're science, you sit in front yes. of a computer and just write a program. So I think there's a major focus on all these fronts that is going on. And then the final element of that is R&D. The mindset of innovation, the creativity. So there is a significant discussions with IMEC in Europe to set up a big R&D center here in India and start developing intellectual property. And especially like Rahul said, uh, Moore's law, the way I was defining was the way Moore defined it initially. But I totally agree with him that it's being extended with tremendous uh, innovations in packaging technology. So that's one area. We have Professor Rao on the advisory board from Georgia Tech, who is the most advanced packaging guy in the world today and actually advises Intel, uh, and he's going to be starting India, teaching them on advanced packaging technology. So we're doing a variety of things to really bring about a big change in India in the next five to 10 years. Just a couple of quick uh, points. Um, <clears throat> one, of course, the testing, packaging, assembling, that's the easy bit, and we do have, uh, as Sudham said, chip designers as well. But I think, ultimately, the heart of you know the uh, entire chain is the fab. Uh, so, I mean, unless you have the fab, uh, it's very unlikely that you'll get an IDM, uh, an Indian IDM, or you'll get, you know, products, original IP, because that's where the, the, you know, the margins ultimately come, you know, in terms of intellectual property and so on. But I think fab is really key. Uh, you know, the things, assembling and so on would happen, and so would design, but until you have a fab, you won't have that com comprehensive uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, to actually become an electronics uh, superpower or electronics, uh, you know, heavyweight. That's one point. The second point I wanted to just comment, and I'm sure Mr. Dham and the other, I mean, I compliment the government for having uh, this time around the right, you know, experts working with them. But it's interesting the way the policy initially, when the policy came out, they actually differentiated the amount of capital subsidy that it give by the node, by the technology node. So initially it was 50% for 28 uh, and below, 40% uh, for 28 to 45, uh, and 30% for 45 to 60. But subsequently, they've made them all 50 in the modification. So that's, I think, a, again, a good thing because we need we need to get in, right? We can't be too, uh, you know, 
as Mr. Ham also said, 45, there's yeah, still a market. I'm just going to suggest that I, we had a first advisory board meeting and uh, Mr. Ashwini Vaishnav went around and asked each board member to state one thing and I stated this, saying make it uniform yeah. for everyone. And I must tell you, and this is encouraging, the minister heard me and within a month got to the cabinet approval and changed it and it made it uniform. For yeah, so I think again that just shows. Really yeah. And I think that's a that's a you know that really is an excellent sign as well. I think it's a good move to make it equal, but the fact that they are listening to experts and willing to modify along the way, I think that's again a very good sign. Uh, uh, and I think again having two technocratic ministers there, you know, with Mr. Vaishnav and Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar, uh, he, he of course a former Intel person, I think that also helps, you know, because this is a highly technical and complex area. So when somebody like Mr. Dham gives advice, you have to be able to you know absorb it and see the merit in it. Quickly, because you've got to move fast as well. You can't, you know, wait forever. So that And similarly, they did it for even OSAT, which is the outsourced ATMP kind of thing. They raised it from 30 to 50. So they, they, they've, they've been open to modifications. And they really, I find this time, I mean, having worked in the government also earlier, not in this space, but, you know, in the Niti Aayog, and, uh, I, I, I see a very clear difference on this particular policy. And I think the self-reliance thing, I think, you know, beyond food, uh, energy after food and energy, I think electronics is really now uh, the third most critical thing. If you really, because everything runs on it already, and more and more things. If you talk about Industry 4.0 or IoT, and everything is going to be electric vehicles. It's going to be more and more dependent on uh, you know, this semiconductor fab. So I think, uh, in that sense, I see the policy was well framed to start with. It was good policy. The changes are even better, uh, and I think you know. The, the government has promised that they're going to move ahead quite fast. There are some credible players, uh, you know, in, in the fray. Uh, excellent advice. So I think, again, if you just look, forget the geopolitics for a second, even domestically, uh, the government is getting a number of things right and is in the right, uh, you know, kind of listening implementation mode. No, that's, uh, that's very encouraging to hear. And um, so hopefully we are on the right track in any case. So uh, and in any case, I'll want to do a quick... Uh, uh, audience round, but I keep a, a bigger question to um, Chongi, uh, Wongi Chong is the whole point about what are the kind of partnerships that you see emerging? Uh, because I think there are also thematic minilaterals taking shape among like-minded countries in terms of even supply chains and so on and so forth. So what are the likelihood, what's the likelihood and what kind of policy environment, what kind of uh, incentive structures are you looking to come into India? You talked about India is a very attractive destination, but what are the kind of things that you want to see uh, for India to attract Koreans into? Yeah, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, first of all, you have the uh, very good uh, the uh, political uh, environment. I mean, you, you have first a very good uh, trust relationship with Americans. I mean, these days we have a lot of uh, uh, cooperation going on with America. That's a very important point. And uh, listening to uh, other experts' uh, comments, uh, I'd like to share what I understand as the secret of Korean economic success story. I mean, do you believe that Samsung or SK were able to grow into global play on their own? No. They are the uh, products of government's industrial policy. Uh, in the in the early days of their uh, industrial growth, they get an, uh, <clears throat> a lot of credits, subsidies, tax breaks, financial favorable financial bank loans. So, uh, I think they are product of Korean industri strategic industrial policy. Uh, but the, uh, the the kind of subsidy and support from the government was not unconditional. It's conditional uh, subsidy and conditional spot based on their performance in international market. Unless you can survive in international market, the government will not favor them anymore. So uh, the Samsung, SK, and Hyundai as well, they were exposed to fierce international competitive pressure so that they need to uh, innovate. They need to uh, invest in R&D. So, I mean, you have talent, you have a very good ecosystem, you have a lot of good uh, kind of uh, environment, right? But unless the Indian uh, private uh, companies in the semiconductor industry, package all those, uh, I don't know about the nitty gritty details, but anyhow, unless the Indian private actors 
when talents, right, are exposed to international market pressure, I don't think uh, the government subsidy support incentives would work. So I think, yeah, just want to. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to talk about the same. I, I want you to relate to this particular, uh, what uh, the kind of uh, emerging partnerships that we are likely to do. But let me quickly take the round of questions uh, before I come back to you. Thank you. So thank you, first of all, uh, uh, to Wong and everyone, including, uh, and sci-fi in particular for this. I uh, just want to ask a question, perhaps doesn't relate to the semiconductor story, uh, but something which is perhaps extremely complex, perhaps in the same proportion, and India is just beginning to think about uh, as well. It is the carbon markets, uh, the Paris Agreement that we have just had. Now we just had an uh, let's say amendment about the that we should have the carbon markets, and the Indian companies will not be allowed to sell a specific portion of the carbon credit that they'll generate in India to the rest of the nation. So my question is, uh, this on the same lines as all of you have been discussing, do you think uh, we are in a position or perhaps we should, I have reasons to believe that yes, but at the same time, uh, anyone can answer if we have any such policies to have any discussions, any policy incentives, or any framework to see if India can also lead, being the third largest emitter of CO2 emission, in this sphere as well. And how long you think that will take? Thank you. Other questions? Uh, right in the front. I'll just come to you. Thank you so much for a very engaging, uh, engaging discussion. Um, I realized that uh, we looked a lot at the future. Um, and I just wanted to quickly contextualize the past as well. I was, I was curious to know, um, I know that Mr. Rao, you mentioned that semiconductors will be very crucial for the, the startup innovation moving ahead. But India still has had, it, it, it ranks third globally, I believe, in, in the number of startups. Um, and it has uh, seen, witnessed a high growth. So I, I wonder, like, what were the, the aspects that we kind of uh, relied more on? Was it more cloud computing capacity? Was it... Um, maybe CPUs, uh, uh, or it, uh, just just one thought uh, of getting some views uh, to contextualize that. Okay, question there at the back. Hi, my name is Dominic, and uh, thank you to the panelists. Yeah, um, I would like to go forward with the word of uh, Mr. Shaw, which is trusted partnership. My simple question would be: first of all, what are we scared of? And secondly, I would love us to go one step back. Uh, because now we are talking about semiconductors, but this is just one portion used for its final product. Let's think about, if we refer to the restrictions and the export control, which is not only in the US, but everywhere in the world, what is going to happen if, for example, a country like Congo decide to put restriction on the cobalt, and then what's going to the future of our phones? Thank you, ma'am. So my question is on the deposits of critical elements. So uh, recently, uh, the World Energy Outlook report, uh, the one by International Energy Agency, it stated that it takes 16 years to develop one uh, whole set setup, out of which 12 years goes into financing and permission and five for construction. So how does uh, like uh, Vedanta is, you know, uh, trying to cope up with that? Um, so I'll just start with uh, commenting. I was formerly with uh, the electronics team that worked very closely uh, with Ministry of Electronics on the semi Semicon India program. And uh, uh, as Dheeraj mentioned, you know, some of uh, one of the best things, uh, one of the uh, really progressive moves was the amendment that came in recently. And uh, that if we put that into context of you know the the automobile. Uh, bus that happened and uh, the 110 million dollar loss that uh, automobile makers face globally it was not the because of the advanced chips but it was because of the 110 130 nanometer process nodes so in doing away with some of those uh, caps and you know the graded incentives that they've had uh, they've managed to sort of become more inclusive and to tie up with some of the uh, questions on hardware I think the idea that India is trying to uh, bring forth is ecosystem development. So it's 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 about 
you know, we have, the, it's, a, it's about growing the electronics ecosystem along with the uh, semiconductor ecosystem as well. So the goals that we have sort of go in congruence to each other. In terms of partnerships, I think, uh, you know, there are some, the Indo-Pacific economic framework came up recently, and I think that that has a lot of potential that perhaps the Quad is missing. You know, we, we initially talked about the Quad and said that perhaps that was a good way to go ahead, and maybe the IPEF has sort of taken that mandate ahead. Um, there was, in terms of minerals, I think there was a uh, mineral security alliance, if I'm not wrong, uh, which was an interesting concept because the raw material is one of the, you know, uh, something that we fear could be weaponized in the future, right? Uh, especially when we're talking in the context of the US and China. Um, so this is, this is a very interesting collaboration that has sort of come into being. India is not a part of it yet. It's trying to be. But uh, I think these are some of the partnerships that we can, we can really work with going forward. Another one, I think, would be uh, in terms of IP. So what India would really require is a good IP framework for, to promote innovation in the country. So learning from some of the countries to very good with the design ecosystem would be a good way for that to happen. So I think, um, so I think that these are some of the focus areas I think we can do in terms of partnerships. I can't uh, I don't think there was any question about either Congo or carbon credits that I would venture into answering. So I could answer your question about uh, startups and whether they benefited from semiconductors. Am I right? I don't think so. Startups uh, fundamentally that uh, I, by the way, I was one of the pioneers for venture capital in India in 2005-6. We started in the US venture partner along with four other uh, VCs who came all from US, from Silicon Valley, all of my colleagues, only to start a new wave of uh, startup, Silicon Valley type startup excitement into India. And I'm glad to see that is today third largest startup uh, environment. But uh, to my dismay, when I came here in 2005, 6, not only there were no chips, there was really not much going on at all in terms of uh, uh, innovation. And luckily, uh, we were in the time period of a 10-year fund where e-commerce came in, and we were investors in Flipkart and Mintra and Snapdeal, and we saved our back and shirt by returning the capital and making some money. So no, I don't think uh, what you needed in all these startups is basically computers. And the computers are all imported in India. They are from various uh, companies. You need servers, you need laptops, you need desktops, you need storage. Everything is coming from outside. There was, I'm sorry? Where do these, most of these imports come from? All of these come from uh, USA predominantly. 90% of everything comes from USA. Now, uh, we, we want to, and I'm not part of this group, but we want to bring uh, our own data center, set up our own cloud computer for reasons of security in India, and there is a big push. Uh, some of us who are not necessarily have enough bandwidth to do everything in life, we are working with the government in, in a variety of areas, including security and drone technology and defense, and uh, because everything is becoming digitized. Like Gurmi said, it's uh, ubiquitous, literally everywhere. So we need to get going very, very fast. But just to add to what Vinod said, it's not just ubiquitous, Sensing, which has been the, the term till now, where you have sensors all around or IoT, but it's also ubiquitous computing. You know, we're going from an era of you know edge computing to or rather in addition to edge sensing and computing, there's near the edge computing where we need a lot more computing power in a very distributed fashion. And, and yes, today a lot of it is coming from outside, but there's no reason why it cannot be developed in India. Again, it's a much longer marathonish time frame we are talking about here, not a sprint. Um, talking about carbon policy, I'm not exactly. I don't. I can't talk about carbon policy, but I do want to mention sustainability. And one of the things of being late to the game, as was mentioned earlier today, is that we can learn from other people's mistakes. Uh, <clears throat> as we set up these infrastructure for fabs, etc., I think it's very important to make sure that sustainability is part of it. Right? If you look at the amount of water that is used for running a large plant, you know, it's in millions of gallons right, for a large plant. 
But over the years, you know, if you take the last 10 years, the amount of water that's being recycled has gone from 40% to upwards of 90%. That's something we can learn from so that we don't have to struggle through it. And I do think there has to be a sustainability clause, policy, et cetera, when we are setting this thing up. And that maybe the government can um, step in, ad advise, regulate, nudge, whatever is the right frame of work, fr framework for that to ensure that the ecosystem is built in a very sustainable fashion. Um, and even from a, going to your point in terms of innovation, I think there's a lot of design engineers here. Um, couple us with the fab, and I think we can make very interesting innovations in a hardware software co-optimized fashion. And it, it's been happening around the world. It's not happened a lot here, again, because of our ability to prototype and test certain things. And setting up of some fabs, I think, will open the door for that. I'll, I'll let the professor d d answer geopolitically what we are scared of. I won't get it. But as an economist, what worries me, and that uh, comes to your question on cobalt and yours later on critical minerals, is concentration of you know a supply chain or for raw material. You know, if there's just one or two countries, um, so Congo again, cobalt is highly risky for that reason because Congo, forget its export ban, it's you know politically highly unstable. You know, wars break out from time to time, so that's anyway a very high risk, uh, which is why a lot of technology research now is trying to move away from uh, cobalt. Lithium is also concentrated in Australia, Chile, graphite in China. In fact, if you look at beyond the mineral, the processing of all of these critical minerals and rare earths is concentrated in China. 60, 70 percent is uh, out of China. So, uh, I mean, apart from semiconductors, there's the entire mineral supply chain which affects many sectors. Uh, which is, So, I, that's what worries me, uh, that 92 percent of our bleeding edge semiconductors are out of Taiwan and Korea. You know, something happens uh, in Taiwan, uh, you know, what happens to the supply chains. Similarly, with minerals, if something happens to Congo, uh, you know, what what happens to uh, supply chains. So I think concentrated su uh, supply chains is what scares me. I think we should, uh, scares is a strong word, but worries me. And, you know, we should work towards, and that's the entire point of the current geopolitics, to try and diversify away and avo avoid such a concentration. So I think up to 20% is okay. If you look at the semiconductor market overall, uh, today it's not so bad. You know, it's 20% uh, Taiwan, 20% Korea, 17% uh, Japan, 14% China. It's not so bad. But China, I mean, the ramp up that's happening now in the next five years, China is going to go, you know, I don't know after these restrictions what will happen, but otherwise it was estimated to go up to about 25 to 30% of global share of semiconductors. So that, you know, when you're starting to get about 30% in one country or 60% of cobalt in one country, that's, that's when you should start worrying, according to me, and, and work towards diversifying. But geopolitically, you can tell us what you're <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you that we need to diversify away from, from East Asia or China in terms of the export market, China per se. Actually, one of the uh, main pillars of external economic strategy of South Korea is to diversify away from China. I think you have already success a story. I mean, Samsung is a invest, has invested huge money in Noida, right? Running huge smartphone factory. This is a success story. So, if Samsung decides to relocate its uh, semiconductor facility to somewhere in India, I don't think the South Korean government would dis uh, oppose. But what I'm trying to uh, what to point out is that uh, I think the age of glo globalization is over. In the age of globalization, uh, if you are the um, global player, I mean, as a global company, I mean, what factors lead you to decide where to invest and to, part to make partnership with? Simple cost-benefit analysis, right? Now you have to factor in geopolitical costs in your corporate decision, right? So the, the corporate strategy has fundamentally changed in this uh, age of uh, geopolitical tech. Or, yeah, that's one. Thank you. Uh, I think this has been uh, a terrific conversation. I think we are completely out of time. Uh, but I'll, uh, we can carry on the conversations uh, during dinner as well. Um, all it reminds me for to do is to thank the terrific uh, panelists uh, who gave us a very engaging conversation. Uh, oh, I think I completely went over the time limit, but I think this has been a very rich conversation. 
thank you uh, to all my panelists and 